I was surprised that the uh, that the thigh flaps are taking a secondary, um, you know, a, a, a second, you know, uh, list compared to the, the 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 trunk flaps. You know, like the, the the lumbar artery flaps and the and the the love handle flaps. That those are the preferred ones. I I, I was under the impression that it was the thigh flaps that were uh, that were the the go-to flaps after an abdominal plasty, or let's say if you don't have a tram donor site. Josh? Yeah, I think I think it sort of depends where you where you are. Um, the like when we were in New York, we went we would always go to the thighs after the like the abdomen always first, and then we would go to the thighs second. Um, they just really didn't like the position changes, and so you know, having seen both, I think in my hands I would prefer the thighs. I don't know, Amanda, what you had experience with when you were in Toronto or Halifax um, with the secondary flaps. In general, we, the only other ones that we did were the SGAP. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Dr. Hofford and I did two of them in my fellowship. So I don't have a lot of experience with the other ones. Yeah. I would think that the position change is really, uh, really something that, that to factor in when you're doing a surgery that's already long and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and tedious and uh, not, not that it, it must be fun surgery, not that it's tedious, but uh, you know, surgery that's long and, uh, and having a flap where you can two team something, uh, you know, uh, and, and taking it from the thigh, I think. What about the donor side of the thigh compared to the, compared to the flank, Josh? The... I mean, I think the donor said it's, it's more obvious. It's just like when you do like a weight loss thigh plasty, um, you get that long, um, you get usually, if you do it like diagonally or vertically, you'll get a long scar along the medial aspect of your thigh. So that's one downside. You can sometimes do the, we did a couple of the transverse paps and the downside there again, it's like, it's like doing a, horizontal thigh lift is that you can sometimes get spreading or widening of the scar um and so the i think the donor site with the flanks like the ones that dr bouchel does it's like he's right it's like it's basically like a circumferential body lift and for the patient which one is more difficult to recover from or or is there is it not significant i would say it's tough to say. I mean, it's like, it's the, I think there's less tension when you do the, like the trunk ones, it's just like an extended abdominal posture, right? Like when you stack the DCIAs with the DIEPs or you do the lumbar arteries. So probably I would say marginally the thighs are a little bit more difficult to recover from than the trunk ones. Interesting. Well, it's, uh, it's almost nine ten. I think maybe we should, uh, we should start. Uh, let's see. I would like to have an aesthetic flat closure first diagnosed. How long is it? I can't seem to move the. Oh, here we go. Um, Hello, I have a ruptured implant and have had six prior surgeries between 213 and 217. I was wondering if there was an option to remove them both and use my tissue. Please note, I don't have a lot of extra weight. So are there still similar options? Uh, Amanda, what do you think? Uh, I, I mean, it definitely is possible to use your own tissue. Again, we have to probably examine you. Josh can probably talk a bit more to the other options outside of the Dieppe flap because that would sort of be my standard go-to flap. Um, if you don't have a lot of redundant abdominal tissues, then some of the other flaps that were discussed would be possible, but it just depends on the surgeon that you're, you're going to see and their experience with them. Well, let's see. Uh, Amanda, what do you, um, in, in, in your practice, uh, how, do you, how do you decide with the patient? A patient comes in and, and, is, and is kind of like, referred and she has a breast cancer and she's going to have a mastectomy and uh and how do you approach this patient like how do you how do you deal with her and how do you discuss options with her now i'll preface this by saying that you know i've been in practice for a while but now dr google is in practice with us and a lot of patients are coming in with a lot of information even beforehand um and and a little bit of uh, some have a lot of misinformation but how do you approach generally a patient who comes in just 
pure and wants to understand her options in terms of breast reconstruction? I think when we start broadly talking about the two different options, so implant versus tissue, um, and certain patients are candidates and not candidates for one or the other, depending on some of the factors that were discussed this evening. And so um, we sort of discuss the pros and cons of each of those. Uh, as you were saying, implants are much more common now because of the shorter recovery time and the better results with the newer techniques that we're using. And so I, I do a lot more of the implant-based reconstruction. Um, however, the flaps are, are good options and the patients who have enough abdominal tissue and who are looking for a more um, durable sort of option with, with fewer surgeries down the road. So it, it really, there's no one, one size fits all answer for each patient. Um, it's a long conversation that I have with each one. And it, a lot of it comes down to patient preference and what they sort of want to, to go through in terms of recovery and what they're looking for. I don't know, uh -huh. Josh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I mean, it's to sort of echo what Amanda just said too. It's like the, my first question I always ask the patient is, you know, do they know what they want? And some people are, you know, totally against implants. Some people are, you know, don't want the, don't want the surgery. And then just sort of, you know, based on their own preferences, like, you know, let's say like a younger woman who's got to take care of a couple of kids at home might not be a best candidate for, you know, a DIP flap, right? Because it's, the recovery time is going to be a lot longer than the implants. Um, you just sort of talk them down all of those I'll often tell the patients that it, it's like, you know, it's like a free flap reconstruction. Like Amanda said, it's like you pay for it all up front, right? It's like you have a longer recovery time up front, but then it's, you know, it's durable. And then we often won't even see the patients after, you know, nine months or a year after surgery. Whereas with implants, it's the, there's a little bit more upkeep and a lot more secondary surgeries that you may end up having. So um, just sort of go through all those things just to help the patient find out what's best for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, somebody here is asking, how common is fat grafting after a lumpectomy? Is it recommended or are there other options for reconstruction after a lumpectomy to fill an area that has a dent left behind? Is it possible to do fat grafting on the side that is not affected to even them out? Uh, since we left off with Josh, why don't we see what Josh says? Sure. Do you ever fat um, graft a lumpectomy defect, Josh? Yeah, I will. So it's all, all I, I, what I like to do is I just do a little like scar subcision because often the scar is tethered down, um, release the scar and then put in some fat grafting. The caveat that it's, um, uh, that, you know, you just have to talk to the patient that they may need multiple rounds of fat grafting to fill in that defect. Um, otherwise, um, another thing that's worked well for the lumpectomy defect is uh, swinging over latissimus if they have enough tissue in their back. Um, doing a pedicled latissimus flap from the back and then just bringing that over and then replacing the, the tissue that was taken away with that. Sure. Amanda, do you, did you want to comment? No, I agree. I often tell the patients that if fat grafting often requires multiple rounds uh, in order to sort of achieve the desired result. And then I think the Are other you? part of the question was addressing, would you fat graft the contralateral breast? Um, and I, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're pertaining to, but may, make it look you know, bigger. I, guess, I think normally if we want to increase the volume, we would put in an implant to balance that other breast. Is, I don't know if there's another no, I think that, that's what she was getting at. Um, is, there, is there any risk in fat grafting affecting um, uh, the follow-up of a patient who, who is, who's had a lumpectomy and has had radiation and in terms of following her up for her, for her surveillance and does fat grafting, uh, is there a possibility of it causing cancer or a cancer to recur? What, how do you cancel, counsel a patient with that? What information do you give them? Um, um, or Josh, Josh. Sure. sure. I think the most recent data, I think it was, I think it was at MD Anderson. They published a study not too long ago showing that, um, the uh, there's it doesn't the fat grafting doesn't affect the uh, recurrence rate of the cancer. And I think it's like it's just like you know it's just like when we fat graft like the direct to implants or whatever you know it's like an experienced radiologist or an experienced mammographer can usually 
um, tell the difference between like if there is a little bit of fat necrosis, tell the difference between that and, uh, and a cancer. Uh, okay. Um, so here we have a, a question here. My DF flap following mastectomy became a tissue expander because of COVID. Initially, I didn't want an implant, but now that I've had a tissue expander for almost a year, I'm wondering about implants. My concern about a DF is my abdomen. Once recovered, will my abdomen be the same? I.e., will I have the same strength? And why would I choose a DF over an implant? Who wants to take that question? Uh, Amanda? Yeah. Um, so there was multiple questions there. So the first one was, will you have the strength? strength? In general, because we don't take the muscle with the DF flap, you, your strength isn't, your abdominal strength isn't compromised. You can experience a sort of a bulge afterwards. So, um, but in general, it doesn't, it, it shouldn't affect your abdominal strength. Um, and the other part of the question was, why would you go with a DF over, DF over Yeah. I, I mean, if you're a candidate for both, it sort of comes down to a patient preference. So, um, you know, the fact that the DF is your own tissue, you don't have to deal with the foreign body. Once we've gone through the initial recovery, you know, the, the likelihood that you'll need to have further surgeries is much less. So it's sort of one of the reasons that you, you could think about having it. Okay. Uh, Peter, I'll ask you, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out to you. Uh, have you done many abdominal flaps in women 60 and above? And would you recommend a, a flap versus an implant in older women? Uh, yeah, I have. And it depends on what other comorbidities they have going on. If, if they're in their mid 60s, but otherwise well and physiologically in good condition, I wouldn't consider that as a contraindication. Uh, I think in some ways it may actually be a better match if they have a natural contralateral breast that has some ptosis, is a little bit larger. I think that's a very tough population to actually match with an implant. Certainly if they're in the delayed setting or if they've had radiation, I think a flap can be a good choice. And it would really just depend, are, are they healthy enough to tolerate a six hour surgery and um, go through some of the hemo hemodynamic shifts? But um, yeah, I would consider it beyond. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to say what cutoff you might have. If the patient was 80, I think I would say no. Not, not for sure if it was really their only option, but. Uh, Mid sixties, I think, is is reasonable. Josh, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think it's the you know it's like it's like Peter said, it's like it depends on their the general health level. They can tolerate the the longer surgery. Um, and then to echo what Amanda said too, right? It's like the you know, in somebody like that, it's the you know, usually if they get a deep flap, then it'll be the it'll probably be the last surgery that they get, right? Maybe a small revision. And so then they won't have to worry about things like, like Capcon or swapping out implants later or anything like that. Um, and then I agreed with Peter, you know, especially for the unilaterals, I really like the, if the patient has the tissue to give, I really like the, the natural look, the natural match that you can get with the, um, the, the deep flap for a unilateral reconstruction too. Amanda, any thoughts about age? I mean, I feel like a, a bit of a broken record, but I think it very much is patient dependent. You know, the 68 is, some women are very healthy, not on medications. I know my, my mother's 68 and I think she'd be a great candidate for DF flap. So I think it very much depends on your comorbidities. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting question. Uh, my surgeon says I'm, I, I have very thin skin. Is prepectoral even possible? I have had implants chosen for cosmetic augmentation 15 years under the muscle and have had no issues. I now have breast cancer and need a double mastectomy. The originals are textured, so they must come out. Trying to figure out what to do with the double mastectomy in terms of the reconstruction. So Amanda, since you're on deck here, uh, how would you approach this patient? What, what advice would you give her? Uh, I think that in this, situation because you already have an implant pocket depending on the size of your breast um, and the skin envelope itself you may be able to remove the textured implants and replace the implant within that same pocket I think that it won't be exactly the same as you had before because you won't have that breast tissue um, but that's sort of if you wanted to go with an implant-based reconstruction, I don't know, Tassie, you have a bit more experience with the prepectoral. What would you do? 
you know, if she's, if she, you know, that's a very good question because if she's thin and uh, you know that, uh, that she's going to have rippling. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and so in, in this case, I might consider, uh, and probably one of the only cases where I would consider doing a submuscular augmentation, um, a submuscular placement of the tissue of the, of the implant with a, with an alloderm sling. Um, just because I'd want to have that, that muscle that's already been atrophied with the submuscular augmentation for all these years. Uh, and and I, I'd, wa I'd want to solve the problem of rippling. But what I, I show patients what uh, a video of what rippling is, and I show patients a video of what a breast animation deformity is. And I, I, I kind of ask them to, you know, choose their poison. Like, what would they not be able to live with and overwhelmingly it's the animation deformity that bothers uh, patients initially you know it's because it's a it's a very it's really it's really something to see and and it's there in, in practically every patient that has had a submuscular breast uh, sub submuscular uh, reconstruction so uh but in this case i think just because of the thinness would you would you consider would you consider a, a autologous tissue reconstruction in her she was a candidate for it, and it's not a bad option. Josh, any comments? Yeah, I think, Peter, we were actually discussing yeah. a nearly identical case this morning um, yeah. that we have coming up, and that's what we were sort of talking about. We have a patient who's got basically the exact same story, um, and we're going to put, uh, do what you had mentioned, just do, um, on the mastectomy side, do a reconstruction with an implant, a subpactral with an ADM sling, and then... Uh, uh, and then just going to swap out the other implant as well because this patient's had them for a while. Yeah. Yeah. She says when she says thin skin, does that mean she doesn't have a lot of breast volume? Because in those cases, uh, I mean, the mastectomy may not really be all that different from where she's starting. Uh, so the pocket's already there. You replace the implant with something that's slightly larger. And I think in a lot of those cases, there isn't really a lot of difference, especially if the, the mastectomy is going to be probably a smaller weight. Uh, I think it'd be more invasive to change pockets or to to replace the entire pocket. You have to close off the pocket. Sometimes they may even leave you some of the capsules. So the the entire implant pocket is um, almost unchanged. If she's happy with what she has now, you're to to completely change gears and offer something different. Uh, I think that would be setting yourself up for potentially an unhappy patient, or if there's complications, then that might be more difficult. Yeah. And as a as a pre pec guy, I think, like I said, this is probably one of the only instances where I would consider keeping the uh, subpectoral plane. Um, we have a question here from actually one of my patients who who had a Goldilocks mastectomy. And what kind of options are available for adjustments down the line? Would you or your colleagues be able to speak to fat injections to minimize interventions and recovery? Uh, liposuction seems less intrusive than a flap to add some volume without having to get implants. Uh, you have any experience with with Goldilocks uh, reconstructions, Peter? Uh, a little bit, but I think you have to have quite realistic expectations in terms of how much is left. At least at our center, the way the mastectomies are done, we're saving maybe less than twenty percent of the breast volume. So you, it would give something and prevents having a complete concavity deformity or um, gives some projection, but uh, it's very different, I think, than what they would be starting with. I've done it in conjunction with implants or um, with fat grafting, but in our experience, it, it tends to be a very small reconstruction what you're left with. Yeah, that's been my experience. Josh, any, any comments? Uh, no, I don't have any experience with Goldilocks. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, you know, one of the reasons there was one uh, uh, topic brought up about going flat. So I think in, in that instance, if a patient has a large breast or totic breast, I think that could be a good option. They, it's almost like going flat, but they're, you're saving some of the tissue. Uh, you get a cosmetic closure out of it, uh, but then without any of the potential headaches or issues with reconstruction. Yeah. <laughs> Is, um, because that's one of the reasons why one would choose a, a Goldilocks mastectomy is to avoid an, a, an implant reconstruction. I mean, that's what the definition of a Goldilocks uh, is. Uh, but I think, I think just, just to answer for that, for, for, for my patient, I, I think having fat grafting, I think would certainly help in that's in, in, in you and being able to increase your, the, the breast volume that you have. Um, 
let's see here. Uh, for someone with multiple sclerosis and BRCA1 positivity, waiting for double mastectomy, is reconstruction even an option? Uh, anybody want to take that? Amanda? I can't see why it wouldn't be an option. Um, you know, an implant-based reconstruction, if something, if you're looking for something that's less recovery is, I can't see why that would be a contraindication. Yeah. I think everybody agrees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what percentage of women are happy after reconstruction, after mastectomy and radiation are most happy with the latissimus flap and the expander or the DF flap? So what percentage of women are happy after reconstruction? Um, I think I think the the the, re the question here has to deal with um, with with uh, flap reconstruction. So, Amanda, what percentage of your patients are happy with their flap reconstructions? I would say the vast majority. Once we get to the end of the journey, are happy with the reconstruction. It's always difficult to because you don't have anything to compare it to. You know, if you've had an immediate reconstruction, you, you haven't had a mastectomy defect. But I would say the vast majority of patients who have had the flap reconstruction, although there's a difficult period oftentimes with the initial recovery are, are happy that they, they did it in the end. Mm -hmm. It just takes time. And I think that's something that you have to sort of realize. Uh, yeah. Josh, any comments? Yeah. I think it's where you see the, the, the happiest patients are the ones that, uh, you know, as like Amanda said, ones that have lived without a breast, right? So who have been flat and then subsequently get a reconstruction. And then there's a, there's a fair amount of patient reported outcome data as well to echo that that population seems to be the happiest. But I mean, generally overall, I think um, the, you know, I've only been in practice, I haven't been in practice that long, but it's all of my patients have been pretty happy so far. Yeah, I think barring complication, there's a, a few patients that they may have a difficult journey that have, need multiple surgeries or have issues with uh, wound healing problems or infection. But when all goes well, I think it, it's a dramatic difference going from uh, radiation without a breast to a, a successful reconstruction with a flap. Uh, I think it's, it's quite dramatic. Um, okay, uh, a Dieppe flap after breast reduction to a C cup for a skin sparing, nipple sparing, prophylactic mastectomy at 47 years old. What is the best BMI to envision so that I have enough to reconstruct both breasts? That's kind of a hard question to answer, eh? I'm not sure I oh, understand yeah. the question. She wants a D cup after, deep flap after breast reduction to a C cup for a skin sparing mastectomy. Uh, what's the best BMI? I, I'm, uh, you're right, I'm not understanding that, that question either. But... A perfect BMI, I think. Uh, if she's looking at changing her weight before surgery, I think that would be a hard one to predict. You might be able to tell in consultation what, how much tissue she has available to think of what's a realistic reconstruction. But um, that, I mean, that could be changed after the fact, or her BMI may slowly change over time, unless she's a bariatric patient that needs uh, bariatric weight loss surgery beforehand. Um, this patient had a deep flap and had an extended flap at the bottom of the flap and was told that this can remove or left in place. I guess we're talking about the little monitoring uh, piece, island. What are the pros of leaving the extended part intact or revising it? Josh, what do you think? I mean, after, you know, after about five days when the complication rate almost, like the failure rate almost disappears, um, really the purpose of uh, leaving, there's really no purpose to leaving the skin monitoring skin paddle on at that point. So um, the only thing is that sometimes, depending on how much native skin the patient has, uh, you may tighten the pocket a little bit, depending on the size of the, the monitoring skin paddle. Um, so, and often what we'll do as well for the monitoring skin paddle is the, if it's like a skin sparing mastectomy, we'll just do an incision around the nipple. And so then that we just turned that monitoring skin paddle into a new nipple. Um, so in those cases, right. I think that it's you know, worthwhile to leave it or just do a nipple reconstruction with it. But yeah, but normally I would say just get rid of it. Right. Um, 
this uh, lady is looking to have a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy for, for being BRCA positive. She's very small breasted, low body fat, and not looking to have a larger breast size. The question she's asking is, is a nipple sparing mastectomy possible? Um, I don't know that that's something that, that you know, it's in the, the realm of what a plastic surgeon would be able to answer. It's more for the oncologic surgeon, but I think, uh, I think we're all experienced in this, and I think a nipple sparing mastectomy uh, is possible, especially for prophylactic BRCA cases. Um, and then it depends on on your choice and your your discussion with your plastic surgeon, whether you want to have an implant based or an autologous based type of reconstruction. But being small, uh, uh, I think the the easiest and quickest answer to your to to your reconstruction would be a an implant based reconstruction, and you don't have to guess the plane where I would say to put it, which is the prepectoral plane. Um, let's see, another question is, has more to do with cancer. Uh, the cancer is three centimeters from the nipple. How do you feel about nipple sparing? I don't think that we should be able to answer that question. It depends on, on the oncologic surgeon and the practice in that, in that hospital. Um, let's see, uh, why do doctors use alloderm in latissimus dorsi flap reconstructions? I, didn't know that they did. Josh, do you know, are you aware of using alloderm with lat, lat dorsis? Sometimes to like, sometimes when people will swing over the lat, um, I don't usually use it, but it's like when you swing over the lat to reconstruct the breast, you can use it as an inferior lateral sling like you would if you're doing a subpectoral recon to reinforce the IMF. Um, so I guess it can give you a little bit more definition, especially with like a lot of the breast borders are violated or if they've been, the patient's been flat and then we, we kind of have to redesign the breast borders. You can use the ADM to support that, but I mean, otherwise just with, you know, I think with appropriate pocket dissection, you can often get away without it. Uh, there's a question here about radiation and radiation with, on a DM, and whether it's better to undergo uh, radiation after the mastectomy on the DM, or whether to 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 allow the radiation to be done in the chest wall and then do the re the reconstruction with the DM afterwards. So I'd like to get the, the thoughts for the three flap guys, uh, Amanda, Josh, and, and Peter. What are your th what are your thoughts on uh, whether to allow the flap to be radiated or to keep it banked down below and then to bring it up at a later date once the radiation is done? Um, Amanda, any thoughts? So I think in general, if you know your because the effect of the radiation on the flap, we can't always predict. It can make the, the reconstruction smaller. If you know you're going to have radiation and it differs from surgeon to surgeon, I would often say, wait and, and do it afterwards. The one drawback to that is that you lose the benefit of having the skin pocket that you maintain with doing an immediate reconstruction. Um, so, you know, in, in general, I would say that if you know you're gonna have radiation for me, I would do a delayed reconstruction. I don't know how the others feel about it. Josh, what do you think? Yeah. I think it's the, you know, certainly I think the convention is to do what Amanda said, but it's the um, training with like with Ed, Ed Bouchel and Tom Hayakawa in Winnipeg, they would, you know, radiation really wasn't even a factor for those guys. And, uh, you know, so certainly you will have a, you know, maybe a, a slight risk of, of fat necrosis, but um, from my experience, the, you know, outside of the skin pocket changes, the flap usually will hold up. So it's, so I would have no problems radiating a, uh, a deep flap. The other thing to consider too, especially if they do uh, um, internal mammary boost radiation, you can have, a, you can have a lot of scarring to the, the internal mammary vessels, which are recipient vessels of choice, which can make the dissection a lot more challenging after radiation. So sort of a give and take, but I think it's the, I feel comfortable radiating the flaps just because that's what I was taught in Winnipeg. Uh, Peter, any thoughts? Well, I think it depends a little bit on the timing or what the priority is from the oncologic team. For the majority of our cases, if someone needs radiation post-surgery, they don't want any delays associated with that. So probably the recommendation would be to delay the reconstruction. We might do something temporary, like a tissue expander, which could save the skin envelope, uh, allow the radiation to be completed, and then we could do a tissue transfer secondarily. 
So it's delayed, but you still get the, some of the benefits of an immediate reconstruction with the skin. Um, from the flap, it's true, putting the inside is a little bit more difficult having radiated vessels, uh, but it hasn't been a major problem. The majority of the flaps we're doing now are in radiated fields. Um, but if, if the opportunity came up where we could do a flap and then the radiation was afterwards, that I also wouldn't have a problem with that, but it, maybe you'd need revisions or some sort of touch up. Okay. Um, another general question, is the DF the only option for immediate reconstruction without implants? Amanda, what would you tell this, this, uh, this lady? So in, if you don't want an implant-based reconstruction, and not a, an abdominal-based flap would be the most common. So at our center, it's a DEP, but you know at many other centers, you can do a TRAM, which is, involves pedicling up the muscle. That does take the abdominal muscle. There are other, uh, some of the other free tissue transfers that I don't personally do, but that um, Dr. Bichelle was talking about would be the other option. So using the lumbar flap or the thighs, but Josh, you have more experience with that than I do. Yeah, it's the, um, it, I think it depends on your surgeon's comfort level with the, the secondary flaps. I mean, it's like, I feel where I did my fellowship, I feel comfortable with the, some of the thigh based ones. So. Um, but it's, you don't get the same amount of volume. So if you're doing a unilateral reconstruction, you might have to take tissue from both thighs just to reconstruct one breast, um, to do an immediate reconstruction. Um, some people will talk about putting in a latissimus and fat grafting it right away. That could be another option. Um, but again, that, well, you'd have to be, the patient would have to be examined to see if they have enough, uh, tissue to give in order to, um, comprise like an adequate reconstruction of the breast. Hmm. Peter, any comments? Uh, it was mentioned earlier with Dr. Bichelle's talk, all the different options. So they, they may be an option that I think it would be unusual, at least for us, that we would go directly to that, some like a lumbar flap or a thigh flap at the first stage for an immediate reconstruction, uh, unless there was some reason that it was absolutely needed, like if there would be a skin defect or a major reconstruction. Um, I would probably prefer to defer that again, do a, a delayed reconstruction from one of the other sites. Mm -hmm. um, if for some reason the abdomen wasn't available or wasn't a good choice. Uh, here's a general question. That, actually, it's a very good question. Uh, it, it concerns um, uh, monitoring moving forward and the method of reconstruction and how does the, the method of breast, uh, of breast reconstruction influence the monitoring of a, of a patient for uh, recurrences, uh, depending on whether she's had implants or whether she's had a flap. Uh, what would, how would you counsel this patient? Uh, let's go alphabetically. Uh, Peter Davidson. Okay. Uh, monitoring. Well, the, the majority of the recurrences would be uh, on the skin side, either the skin or the nipple. So that's easier to, easier to monitor whether there's an implant or a flap in place. If there's a recurrence on the chest wall, it's a little bit more difficult. That's not something that would be discovered clinically with any of the reconstructive types. Uh, that would be rare, but something that would have to be discovered on imaging. So other than the clinical surveillance and what you see on the outside, the majority of that would be taken by the, the oncologic team. Uh, most patients would have a regular follow-up for many years, uh, starting with probably twice a year and then yearly beyond that. Uh, Amanda? Yeah, I mean, I think it falls to the oncologic team, but I, I think that it's the question whether it's more difficult to detect recurrence if you have an implant or a flap, is that? Yeah, like, like the, does the choice, does the type of reconstruction uh, uh, impact at all in the surveillance of, of, of like she's worried about surveillance afterwards and, and will, will, uh, will one or the other make it more difficult or easier to, 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 to monitor them in the post-op period? Not, not that I know of. I, I again, no, I, I don't do the surveillance, but there's nothing that I've read or, or studies that I've heard that says one or the other makes it more difficult. Josh, are you? Yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't come across any data that um, says that uh, any type, any particular type of reconstruction will have an impact on cancer to, or recurrence detection or anything like that. Okay. Uh, okay, so here's a question of the disease about that's really quite prevalent. Uh, does having diabetes have any effect on uh, deep flap surgery? 
Josh, since you're on the screen. Sure. Um, I mean, it's the, the big thing is that it's the, there's a lot of wounds that need to heal, right? Like there's the abdominal incision, there's everything around the breast. So the, the same thing with any surgery for diabetes, you know, you're more susceptible to wound healing problems. You're more susceptible to infection. Um, you can be more susceptible to sort of, I think pretty sure more, more susceptible to bulges or abdominal wall defects. Um, and it's, again, it all comes down to the, the impaired wound healing associated with diabetes. But if you are a diabetic and you're, you know, you have good tight glycemic control, um, then, you know, your chances of a complication will be slightly higher, but, you know, I think it, I would still feel comfortable operating on a well-controlled diabetic. Okay. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't pass her up as a, as a, as an option, just because she's a diabetic. It, it, it has to do with control and the glycemic index, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Amanda, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think I agree with Josh. I think that, you know, you can cancel the patient that there's a slightly increased risk of wound healing complications, but it wouldn't be a reason not to do it for me. Uh, let's see, here's an interesting question. Can you do prepectoral implant reconstruction if you had radiation after mastectomy? Um, so I'll just quickly answer that. Uh, you, you, one thing you cannot, you cannot do uh, is a submuscular um, implant reconstruction uh, I mean, I'm assuming you've had a mastectomy, so you're going to need two stages. You're going to need a tissue expander to stretch out the soft tissue, and then you're going to need an operation to take out the tissue expander and replace it with the permanent implant. So uh, certainly putting the, the tissue expander under the muscle will not work, but there is more experience being gained putting the tissue expander just under the skin in the prepectoral space. And, um, and you know, for a, for a small to medium-sized breast, uh, it can work. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the correct answer, the best thing for in that situation is to undergo a flap operation. That's the one that has the highest rates of success. But in the patient who doesn't want to undergo that type of surgery, we can certainly uh, attempt a prepectoral uh, reconstruction using a tissue expander uh, in the prepectoral space, um, if there has been radiation in the in the chest area, yeah. Any any comments? No. Yeah, just in those cases, I would fat graft at each stage. So you know, you need two stages. I would fat graft at the first stage, uh, and then again at the second stage, and that gives you some improved compliance of the skin that you regain a little bit of elasticity, uh, combat some of the stiffness that comes with the radiation and the, the blood supply issues. Um, yeah, I think you can have a, re a successful reconstruction, but with reasonable expectations that the skin just may not stretch beyond a certain point or that there's a higher risk of failure, at which point you have to have the flap to salvage that. Yeah, that's actually an, an excellent point about uh, uh, fat grafting before you do any type of uh, major interventional surgery. And, uh, and that's actually a very good point. I want to ask the flap surgeons, um, there hasn't been much talk about latissimus dorsi flaps for breast reconstruction. How come? Uh, I would... Since I've got, yeah, Amanda? Uh, I would say because in general, the latissimus dorsi is one that we use in a delayed reconstruction where you've had radiation in conjunction with an implant, and it's sort of a special subset of patients. So um, the vast majority of the reconstructions we do nowadays are immediate, and so it doesn't often come into play when we're doing an immediate reconstruction. It's sort of that patient who's had a mastectomy, has been radiated and needs to have healthy skin and tissue come in in addition to um, an implant to create a mound. It's not a sole modality to reconstruct the breast on its own because there's not enough tissue with the muscle and the skin from the back alone. Um, yeah, I think it's a great backup. It, for the most part, it won't uh, avoid you needing an implant. So. Uh, if you're needing an implant anyways, but if you have skin heal skin problems, radiation damage, then it's a, a great backup, but not often our first choice. Certainly not in um, immediate reconstruction. Uh, Josh, anything to add? No. no, I agree. I think it's a very, a very powerful backup when you need to recruit skin or when you've lost skin because of an infected device or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, just echo what the other two said. Instead, it's like you just 
you can't use it alone to reconstruct a breast or in very rare circumstances can use it alone to reconstruct a breast. Uh, here's an interesting question. Uh, do you recommend women waiting until after they've had kids to get reconstruction? I, I'm, I'm assuming that the question has to do more with uh, a, an abdominally based DF flap, but uh, so let's let's take that that that's the the, the, impl the the implied scenario here. Josh, do you recommend women waiting until after they've had kids to get a, a, a DF flap? I think it's the, you just need you really need to counsel the the patients on the the pros and the cons of it. You know, because it's the we do the DF flap will often, you know, repair like a rectus diastasis or something like that. Um, and, you know, and then that's just going to come back after they have kids. Um, this, there's a good chance that the scar will stretch out. Um, you know, and then it's the, one of the advantages of the DF flap is that it's, you do get that sort of tummy tuck out of the surgery. Um, and so it's as long as the patient understand how their body will change after pregnancy, if they've had a DF flap, I wouldn't necessarily counsel them against it, but, um, you know, all things equal, I think I would, uh, you know, advise them that it's, the outcome will probably be better if they waited till after pregnancy. Okay. Yeah, I think it depends on the time frame a little bit. If, if they're looking to have kids within the next year or two, then it would certainly make sense. Uh, patients in their early 20s interested in breast reconstruction just for lifestyle and to, to get back to normal, then I think it's certainly be worthwhile to consider it at that point. And if kids are a distant consideration, then then you can cross that bridge when you come to it. Wonder maybe the question is about uh, prophylactic mastectomy. Yeah, I think that I think I think yeah, that's a yeah. I mean, important. and I would probably say the same thing if uh, if a woman's in her early twenties and has been seen by the genetic counselor, they need to decide what the risk profile is. It probably makes sense to think of a pregnancy sooner rather than later. And then once that's done, then they then we can move on with the mastectomy reconstruction. Uh, Amanda, any comments? I mean, I, I agree with them. I don't really have anything else to add. Uh, let's go back to the latissimus flap. Uh, I have concerns about the functional Im implications of removing the latissimus flap and also whether it, and, and I have concerns about lymphedema. So what are the limitations that I'm gonna, that I can get when my, when the latissimus is used? And is there a risk of getting lymphedema? Uh, whoever wants to answer. Sure. So I think it's the, the functional implication of latissimus flap, unless the, you know, you're a competitive rower or swimmer or, you know, competitive chin up person or something like that. The functional impact of losing the latissimus is marginal. Um, then with respect to lymphedema, the lymphedema has a little bit more to do with whether or not there's any sort of axillary work done, like axillary node dissection, whether there's radiation to the axilla, anything that'll cause like fibrosis or scarring that's to block off the lymphatic drainage of the arm or to sort of like fibrose or cause any sort of like obstruction of the axillary vein. And so with that, with the dissection of the latissimus flap, we don't usually run into those types of problems. So the impact of latissimus flap on lymphedema, I would say would be very low. The functional impact of latissimus flap, I think I would say in most people is very low. Um, but if you do have other, you know, axillary work done, then you should, you know, then lymphedema is something that you should be aware of. Uh. I mean, there may be a chance of improving some of the fibrosis across the axilla just by, mm -hmm. by bringing in new tissue. If they've already, presumably they've had radiation, they may be able to release some of that scar tissue by bringing across the latissimus. So I don't think it, it would really make that worse in most cases. Uh, if they're really worried about the functional implications, there, there is a way to spare part of the muscle, which I sometimes do, where you take just a vertical segment or more of a Tdap uh, perforator flap, so you're preserving the function of the muscle, but still getting the benefit of the skin from the back. If, if a person was of that lifestyle where they were really needing or worried about their latissimus muscle. Amanda, any, any comments? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I think unless you're, you're a competitive rower, you're doing a lot of rock climbing or overhead things, and it's something you probably won't miss. Um, here's a question about BMI. Is there a BMI cutoff 
so to speak of for autologous reconstruction uh, as in a DF flap? I'd like to know how much weight I have to lose uh, in the next nine to 12 months in anticipation of seeing my plastic surgeon. So is there, is there a, BMI, how does BMI play a role in here? And is there a cutoff? Uh, Josh, in your, in your DF practice, in your flap practice, do you? Do I think you it, a, it varies from patient to patient. Um, and certainly if the patient is, um, if the, the patient is, the BMI is very high, then you know then they set themselves up for a lot of uh, complications notably donor site problems and uh, hernias and bulges and things like that but you know that's but the one of the benefits of having a slightly higher bmi is that you have more tissue to give for your for your reconstruction so it's usually it would i don't know i probably wouldn't offer say don't have a hard and fast one but it was like in the 35 to 40 range i would have some serious reservations um, but there are exceptions and it's something yeah. that the patient should discuss with their plastic surgeon. Yeah. It may really depend on where the fat's distributed. A BMI is sometimes an unfair judgment of a person's body habitus. And, uh, yeah, the, the heavier patients typically are better candidates for a DF flap. So it might be worthwhile meeting the plastic surgeon first to have an idea of what, what really would be their, their best scenario. I mean, yes, if you're in the morbid obesity category where all your risks are higher and your maybe BMI of over like uh, mid forties, then, then you're probably better to, to lose weight for many reasons. One of them being breast reconstruction and they might be a, someone who would benefit from bariatric consult. Uh, Amanda? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that there's no, it, it varies surgeon to surgeon in terms of a BMI cutoff, I think over 35, some surgeons have none, some surgeons stay around 35. Above 35, we know that your perioperative complications, so risks of things like DVT go up significantly. And so, you know, for me, if it's really above 35, I think that um, I would aim for something sort of 35 or, or below. Okay. Uh what is the degree of risk for flap failure, necrotic failure for a DEP versus a tram flap? Anybody want to answer for flap surgeons? So, so, so flap failure is in general like less than 1% for a free flap for, for DEPs. For a tram, it's a different type of surgery and I actually don't do them, but it's, it's very low as well. So you don't need to monitor the tram flaps in the same way that you need to monitor the DF flaps because you don't disconnect the blood vessels and reattach them. So it's a shorter sort of monitoring period and shorter time in hospital in general mm -hmm. at, at the cost of taking that, that muscle. Um, so I, you know, some of these questions are they're, they're they're great questions, but I think they're much better answered in the in a in a one on one with the uh, seeing the plastic surgeon who's able to examine you and 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 get and get some more information. But what is the best outcome when we like the idea of the warm and soft breast that the DF offers for immediate reconstruction? Uh, should I try implants first and see if we are comfortable, or go straight to the DF? And if the one of the flap fails, then go for an implant. Josh, what do you think? Or Peter, what do you think? As if this is a bilateral case, I think yeah. for myself, I would counsel to go towards the implants. I think the vast majority of cases, we can get a, a good result, good symmetric outcome without the morbidities. Uh, flap can be preserved if, if for some reason you're having complications or other issues with the implants. If, if you're really unhappy, then you could do the, the bigger surgery. Uh, but the implants, especially as an immediate surgery is relatively straightforward, doesn't burn any bridges. Um, and the majority of our patients are, are happy. Things you can do afterwards, smaller procedures that again are, are, are safe and straightforward like fat grafting to help camouflage the implants that you don't see it and you don't um, and feel it. And, and the majority of patients get used to their implants. Okay. Uh, it's 9.57. We're being asked to refer back to the main session now. I think we've, uh, we're finishing our session. We can go back to the main where there's going to be close, the, closing, uh, the closing discussions. But I want to thank the, uh, the panelists and, uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, specifically the, the, 
the the audience who took time to uh, to to come and attend and and who came up with all these thoughtful and challenging questions for us. Uh, looking forward to whatever next year will bring. Who knows what kind of reality we'll be in? But maybe maybe we'll be back again. Uh, but um, good night, and uh, we'll see you in the main sessions.